in Geneva, in Italy, and later specialized both in computational neuroscience and also in elective physiology. Um, he did a postdoc in Berlin, Switzerland, and was also junior group leader at the group of Henry Markram uh, before he moved to Antwerp, actually. And today I think he will present a model um, how, uh, that explains how short elasticity can achieve connectivity in it. Thanks a lot for the introduction. I have a big responsibility because I have just 60 seconds, according to the, to the program, to deliver this talk. So I will skip the title. This will become clear. I will uh, acknowledge uh, particularly the collaboration with uh, Dr. Eleni Vasilaki, senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield, uh, with which this work has been carrying, uh, carrying out, and the funding agency, the Royal Society and the European Commission that funded this work. And indeed, I will try to, to, to be fast, but I have to thank the previous speakers because they uh, gave uh, a very good introduction about some of the topics about uh, short-term synaptic dynamics, which will be the topic uh, of, this, uh, of this presentation. So the main topic here is about understanding the synaptic organization of the brain. And I, I'm aware that at this conference, the, 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 the field of connectomics has been already uh, mentioned. And here is just to, uh, with two pictures to uh, remind you of some uh, technological and molecular biological attempts at the brute force reconstruction of the wiring diagram of the brain. I will focus, however, on a different, on a slightly different approach, uh, stemming from technological uh, uh, opportunities uh, at, and also coming from the fact that at the microcircuit level there might be uh, individual differences and this uh, wiring diagram is likely to change over time. So something that was proposed uh, and made and shown to be accessible technologically in the recent literature is the so-called uh, few nodes uh, wiring diagram dissections or the dissection of the connectivity motif at the level of small microcircuits. So not thousands of neurons, not definitely billions, but few two, three, four. And I will, I hope to convince you that this is enough and it gives uh, some initial interesting uh, feature uh, among them uh, that several non-trivial non uh, random, non-random uh, 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 features have been revealed. So particularly connectivity is non-random. And therefore, uh, um, this uh, technology is related to establishing uh, conventional uh, slice work, I'm sorry, this is not good. So, is uh, coming from uh, an addition to neuroanatomical methods to conventional patch clamp recording in uh, acute uh, cortical slices, for instance, in which people by multi electrodes, uh, uh, by multi patch uh, recording setup, uh, pioneered among the others by Henry Markram and by uh, uh, Jesper Schostrom, uh, from which this work is taken, could detect connections in a functional way. They could elicit action potential firing in a presynaptic neuron and they could look for the echo, the uh, excitatory postsynaptic potential in this case in the, uh, uh, in the postsynaptic cells and whenever they observe a connection they could actually draw uh, the connectivity diagram. There is also another information about the weight of this uh, connection but I will not uh, talk about that uh, now. So uh, the non-random feature that were uh, shown and uh, that are quite interesting is the overexpression of some connectivity motif, particularly the overexpression of uh, B-directional uh, connections. So neuron A is projecting to neuron B and higher than the chance than what you would expect by random connectivity, neuron B is also projecting back to neuron A. And there is also evidence, although the numbers are very low, so the statistics is very, uh, uh, very poor in a way, despite attempts to compensate, at the level of triplets. And as you can see also, uh, there, is a, uh, there is an overexpression of uh, motif in which there is this bidirectional reciprocal uh, connectivity. So the question uh, came in the literature recently, also in the community of uh, computational neuroscientists, where is this asymmetry coming from? And maybe this comes from conventional long-term plasticity and the, the fact that uh, uh, in some forms of this long-term potentiation and long-term depression, there is an asymmetry and this asymmetry is in time, particularly in the time difference between the presynaptic and the postsynaptic uh, uh, action potential firing, this could maybe explain why you observe sometimes an overexpression in some area of the cortex. So here I'm referring to, to the glutamatergic system, particularly pyramidal to pyramidal uh, uh, um, um, cell uh, synapses. 
So modeling allows to explore a specific hypothesis, and one hypothesis that was uh, considered, particularly by the group of uh, Wolfram Gerstner and by my colleague uh, Eleni Vasilaki, was whether this non-random connectivity could indeed emerge from this spike timing and frequency and firing rate dependent plasticity. And uh, what they did in a Nature Neuroscience paper, they considered a toy network model where individual neurons were extremely simple, no biophysical details other than in, the, in their excitability modeled by an integrate and fire model and, uh, in, and also uh, featuring a specific type of spike time independent plasticity. They try to relate and they convincingly show that uh, this could be related to the emergence of connectivity motifs, external activity and the external activity could have reflected the way inputs are represented, how information is represented, whether or not this is represented in a rate code by elevation of, uh, of the number of spikes per second in one neuron instead of a neighboring neuron, or whether it's the precise order, the sequence of activation, whether this is leading uh, to the connectivity motifs. And indeed, they show that external activity could uh, uh, explain the emergence of, of those overexpression of, of connectivity motifs, particularly re they related to the, inf to the possible information coding. Very briefly, what they did, they assumed in a very simple model that uh, the information could be encoded in the rate levels or in the sequence of activation, as I said, and because of the spike time dependent plasticity and its asymmetries, and another ingredient, which is the firing rate dependence, they could show that in one case uh, the uh, 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 reciprocal motifs were overexpressed, and in the other case it was instead the temporal causality of the action potentials and the sequence uh, of, uh, uh, of activation of the neurons that were indeed instead generating or, or potentiating uh, synapses and leading to instead unidirectional. And this feature that I mentioned uh, 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 already, uh, in addition to the spike time independency, is the fact that in precise models of STDP, as you increase the firing, uh, the, the frequency of the pairing between the pre and the postsynaptic neuron, LTD, regardless of this causality, pre before post or post before pre, is uh, reversing into an LTP, like in the Hebbian conventional uh, plasticity. However, synapses are more than plugs, and here is where I'm grateful to the previous speaker to show that these are physical systems. And as all physical systems, they undergo transient fatigue, for instance, synaptic vesicles are going to be exhausted, or uh, 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 because of accumulation of calcium in the presynaptic uh, uh, button, there can be a facilitation, and this has been already described and mentioned and reported for the first time in the neuromuscular junction, and then later kind of rediscovered in the cortical, uh, the central nervous system in the cortical synapses, for instance, among uh, pyramidal cells, and uh, here are examples of this progressive non-stationary activity-dependent uh, transmission of individual presynaptic action potentials in a depressing fashion or in a facilitation, facilitating fashion. How is synaptic dynamics related to connectivity motifs? This has been reported in the literature recently and uh, perhaps uh, uh, not uh, considered particularly interesting, but it struck our uh, attention, our interest, because at the glutamatergic system, uh, synapses of the prefrontal cortex of the ferret, the visual cortex of the ferret, as well as in another glutamatergic system, in the uh, mitral cell to mitral cell uh, connection, the olfactory bulb, what has been reported is an overexpression of facilitating synapses in uh, reciprocal motif and uh, an overexpression of depressing synapses when th the connectivity motif is only unidirectional. This is by no means exclude the other case, but this is more, more often associated facilitation with reciprocal and depressing with non-reciprocal. And this is the quantification obtained uh, by, uh, uh, by friends and colleague Michele Pignatelli in his PhD thesis in the olfactory bulb, in which you actually see that uh, indeed once more red is facilitating associated to bidirectional and uh, blue depressing associated to unidirectional motifs. So the question is natural, how is this emerging? And once more modeling could allow us to explore specific hypotheses and the hypothesis that we formulated is that maybe synaptic short-term dynamics 
and long-term plasticities, the two components that I introduced in a mo moment ago, are determining or contributing to the emergence of these of this motifs. And because the model allows one to perform experiments that would not be possible uh, in, uh, in vitro or in vivo, one could also ask how, which are the ingredients, the essential ingredients for this. So we build a similar, so on the similar philosophy of the previous paper by, by the group of Wolfram Gerstner, a toy model, rather toy model. We don't explain the connectivity of the entire cortex, of course, and we add that uh, the fact that synapses were also uh, showing and displaying uh, synaptic dynamics by means of the very well-known Zodix marker model. And what we focus, instead of the externally imposed activity, we focus on the endogenously, so the internally generated activity, considering synapses, considering neurons connected only by facilitating synapses, or by depressing synapses, and I will relax this uh, uh, hypothesis in a moment. And what we found, if you want to shut down your brain because of the lack of glucose, is that indeed this uh, co-occurrence of facilitation on bidirectional motif, depression on unidirectional motif, could be explained by the interaction between short-term dynamics and long-term plasticities. And the interesting thing is that this is reflecting not the external, or in addition, complementing the previous case is not reflecting the external activity but instead the recurrent internally generated activity and I will show you in a moment how. This is just to show that we consider conventional exponential integrate and fire units with adaptation and the Markham Sodix model for facilitating as well as for depressing synapses these are clearly uh, simulated uh, traces and on the top of this we actually consider postsynaptic long-term potentiation in the form of spike timing dependent as well as firing rate dependent. And for those of you who are familiar with this, we, in other words, accounted for the so-called triplet effects in which uh, uh, the at high pairing, uh, pairing frequency LTD is switching uh, to LTP regardless of the, of the causality of the pre- and postsynaptic uh, firing. So we consider a very simple model for this, uh, uh, for, for this slide, made of 10 neurons, and at the beginning the connectivity was, uh, was random, and uh, it was exposed to the same background activity, it was a noisy background activity mimicking what uh, uh, cortical neurons could experience in vivo during non-selective uh, activity, and we had in addition, and it will become clear why we did, we did that, also a kind of cycling, repeating, determining component. This is, doesn't really need to be cycling, but it needs to be a deterministic component that we had, uh, we added as a background activity. So what we observe is that when you have neurons connected by depressing uh, synapses, you have uh, that all the connections that are formed after a while, that letting the, uh, the, the network to evolve its weight, and this is by, by, by the way, it's a double dynamics. We don't freeze uh, synaptic weight, it's uh, neuronal dynamics influence synaptic dynamics and synaptic dynamics is also influencing uh, the, the neuronal dynamics. So the system is stable in a way. And here I'm using the convention that whenever the connection is dashed, it means it's unidirectional. Vice versa, when the connection is indicated by a, a, a continuous line, it means that it's bidirectional. Depression led to mostly or in all uh, unidirectional connections and facilitation led to most uh, bidirectional connections. So here you see more continuous lines. And because it's a model, we could plug uh, uh, basically all the electrodes where we wanted and you notice that here the number of action potentials are uh, less, they are, they, are, uh, they are more sparse than in this case. Facilitating networks, as intuitively you would expect, contain more action potentials. And I will get back to this to give you an intuitive flavor of an explanation why we observe this. So this is, was, was one simulation. We wanted to, uh, to get the statistics, so we repeated this 2,000 times, um, generating a measure, a very simple measure, just one number between 0 and 1. 0, unidirectional connections prevail, 1, all the connections in the network are, are instead bidirectional. 
And we repeated this over and over, and we could uh, initialize the, the network randomly in terms of connectivity, in terms of topology. And as the time in arbitrary unit is, uh, is uh, passing, you actually see that with depression, uh, most of the network uh, will all uh, uh, converge to low values of this synaptic symmetry matrix index. As I said, I will not enter into the details, but zero means all unidirectional and one means all bidirectional. Vice versa, with facilitating synapses, uh, there, there was a uh, convergence towards higher values of this symmetry index. And what is interesting is that not all the simulations converge to a network with a, uh, with a, uh, with a larger number of uh, bidirectional synapses. So here you actually see a small fraction of the simulations that led to uh, uh, networks that were not uh, with more bidirectional motifs, possibly suggesting a role for heterogeneity in, uh, in the experiment or an explanation for heterogeneity in the uh, experimental data. So because it's a model, we could open the black box and we could see and we could identify the minimal, the essential feature. The first is heterogeneity in the firing rate distributions. And I tried uh, to give you an intuition, I will give you another one and then I will show you a more quantitative analysis based on mean field analysis. And again, I'm in depth with the previous speaker for mentioning it. So if you have neurons connected by depressing synapses, after a while, in case of recurrent activity or externally generated activity, it doesn't matter, the synapses are going to get fatigue and effectively neurons are going to decoupled. Vice versa, if, if neurons are connected by facilitating synapses, the more activity there is, the more the synapses are getting stronger and so the more activity uh, will be uh, produced internally because connections are in general recurrent. So it's a kind of positive feedback. And you can analyze this quantitatively by mean field uh, analysis. So you can resort to numerical simulation of integrated and fire models as well as uh, uh, equivalent mean field, extended mean fields uh, uh, analysis for homogeneous network of facilitating synapses, uh, for of neurons connected by facilitating synapses or depressing synapses. In this particular case, with, uh, with only feed forward inhibition, but only with also with feedback inhibition, the results don't change. You can prove that in the analysis of the attractor states or the emerging firing rate of this network, both in the case of unbalanced or balanced external inputs, the facilitating network is always going to fire at higher firing rates than the depressing network. It seems trivial, it can be also uh, um, appreciated analytically because of the simplicity of the mean field version of the markram sodix model. And this is also the case for balanced external inputs in which you might have multiple equilibrium points. The equilibrium points should be the intersection of this uh, uh, gray and black curves with the unitary slope line. And the intersection of the facilitating network are always higher. So you always have higher frequencies. And you remember that I mentioned at the beginning that, and this is the second ingredient, that the spike time independent plasticity is going to switch and to become uh, uh, to, to, to become and have an associative uh, plasticity rule as soon as the firing rate is higher than some kind of uh, frequency, some pairing frequency, which I will call a critical frequency, which is not that that high, it's of the order of 30, 40 uh, uh, spikes per second with the numbers, with the parameters identified for cortical uh, um, uh, synapses. So this is the second ingredient and in order to show that this inversion and the temporal uh, um, and, the, and the temporal feature of the plasticity are the, 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 the key ingredient, we could alter the plasticity rule, we could use in this case, it's the pair-based STDP rule, the first that was proposed in the literature. It will not change if you increase, well, it will, but it will not reverse LTD into LTP in the way the triplet rule is, is performing. And when you do so, regardless whether the network is, is made of synapses that are de short-term depressing or short-term facilitating, these uh, networks are going to evolve to always a relatively low uh, synaptic matrix symmetry index. So uh, the, what the, the main ingredient is not the, the temporal window, but it's the frequency dependence. Here it's broken and the, 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 the uh, physiological uh, con connectivity motifs are not emerging anymore. You can, you can change and alter the temporal window, for instance proposing a kind of 
potential anti-STDP that is, by the way, reported in the literature, but retaining the frequency dependency, and you recover the same phenomenon. So facilitating leads to higher value of symmetry, that means bidirectional motifs are overexpressed, and depression leads to low values, unidirections are overexpressed. Concluding, I would like to relax the hypothesis that I made at the beginning about the homogeneous character of this population. What happens if you consider heterogeneous population composed of both facilitating and depressing synapses? Here are once more indicated in the framework by the notation of the mean field uh, uh, approach, and I will get very fast here. Uh, it turns out that as a consequence of the Hebbian character, the associative Hebbian character of this STDP triplet base rule, the configuration that is uh, depicted here by uh, uh, thick lines between the two populations is stable. And uh, to show microscopic simulations that this is indeed the case, I show here the firing rate distribution and here the uh, fraction, I will count the number of, synapse, of synaptic motif for a network of only depressing synapses. And here you see that the f all the neurons, all the integrated and fire neurons are firing. This is a much larger network, so I omitted to say it's a 1,000 neurons. And they all largely fire at relatively low firing rates. And unidirectional uh, depressing motifs are overexpressed. If the network is composed by facilitating synapses, neurons are firing at higher firing rate, indeed uh, matching what the intuition and the mean field analysis. And uh, reciprocal motifs are overexpressed. And when you consider the heterogeneous population, so everything in the same network, you actually have that you have a split between a group of neurons that are connected by depressing synapses that will fire less, although some of them will fire uh, more. And uh, the, the, ne the neurons connected by facilitating synapses will fire at higher frequency, higher than this uh, um, uh, critical value. And once more, you will have uh, reciprocal facilitating, more expressed than unidirectional facilitating, and unidirectional depressing more than uh, reciprocal depressing. Concluding, uh, there is evidence for non-random feature and I welcome and I'm, I'm extremely interested in these new recent data where connectivity is also accompanied by synaptic physiology in terms of synaptic uh, uh, dynamics. And the, the co-occurrence of connectivity motifs and specific properties have been found in distinct area. I believe it might be a property of, of, of a large variety of glutamatergic synapses. An existing biological mechanism here combined as a kind of elementary system approach. STDP and uh, the, the Zodix marker model are sufficient to explain uh, the observation, the, the experiments. And the interplay between synaptic dynamics and neuronal dynamics leads in this specific example, so in silico, in this very simple model, to a stable configuration. And it might lead, might propose specific experiments to test this hypothesis. And I conclude thanking you for your attention. Okay, thanks Miguel for this very interesting talk. Um, are there questions? Um, does your model include uh, homeostatic plasticity mechanisms for rate scale? No, it doesn't. So the way this is um, implicitly accounted for in the model is by these uh, hard boundaries of the synaptic weights. So the synaptic weights are going to hit these boundaries. The next step is indeed uh, including homeostatic plasticity mechanism or perhaps more interesting a recent proposal by the group of Larry Abbott for the so-called time-shifted STDP that apparently is intrinsically stable without boundaries and without the need of homeostatic uh, plasticity mechanism. Other questions? If not, I would like to thank all the speakers again. Thank